There's no better place to start than in the second chapter of, of Acts. Things start to happen there that will launch the movement of Christianity uh, throughout the entire world and even down to this present age. And we are indebted to those disciples who became apostles and who also uh, launched the movement of Christianity as they were following the dictates of the Holy Spirit. And so I, I want to just uh, uh, spend a moment or two with you in uh, a series of scripture verses uh, here in the second chapter of Acts, the second chapter of Acts. Acts is the history book of the church. And then I'm going to come back uh, on next Sunday and just look at that 40th through the 47th verse and kind of peel, if you wouldn't mind, me using that expression and, and dig around uh, those verses, and especially the 42nd verse, and work with that in this month, and we'll keep on going as the Lord leads us throughout the entire year, uh, just in this section of uh, the 40th through the 47th verse. If, if it's all right with you, um, um, I hope it's all right with you. At least the Holy Spirit told me that it would be all right with you. But I just thought I'd check in. Join me at that second chapter, if you will, and uh, verse number one. Then we'll pick it up at 14 through 21. And then we'll come at the last section of 40 through 47. Chapter 2 of Acts, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the leaven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation than those who gladly receive his words were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, and house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I'd like to lift as a topic to go with this text and for your thinking, a subject to go with this scripture and for this sermon. Teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you'll bless your word and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Bless your word, dear Lord, that it'll be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Bless your word, dear God. Send it forth and please do not allow it to return into your void, but do that which you have called it to do. Bless your word, dear Lord, that we will not just be hearers of it, but doers of it. Bless your word, Lord that we'll come to understand it as the words of eternal life. For the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of God shall stand forever. Bless your word, Lord, that your word will become our words and our words will become your word. So let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. Speak, Lord. Thy people heareth. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. On last Friday, it was an exciting moment. It was a wonderful moment. Last Friday, July the 1st, 2016, will be for many of us here in Norfolk and certainly in this surrounding area of uh, Hampton Roads and Tidewater. We elected an African American as mayor of the city of Norfolk. (laughs) He's also noted to be perhaps the post baby boomer first to be elected, a combination then of two changes. And change has certainly been that which many people will say I've experienced in these years that I've been allowed to live. I've seen things happen that I didn't believe would happen, and yet dreamed of it happening. That was the essence of what I thought I was hearing coming from the lips of the mayor of the city of Norfolk, Kenneth Cooper Alexander. He said, I would have never believed, but I dreamt it, that a boy from Berkeley would become a mayor. My ears perked up a little bit, my eyes sort of twinkled a little bit when I heard it and I also read it in the newspaper that I've been hearing it for a while now. People who can say that they've seen things that they would never have believed would have happened, but they had dreams that perhaps it could happen. I remember coming in uh, during the year of uh, 2008 And my mother-in-law would be fussing because she had been watching CNN all day long. And it just looked like the newscaster and the pundits were picking Barack Hussein Obama apart. And then that night, November the 4th, does anybody remember? In 2008, He became the first. I'm not too sure whether that's always a good thing, (laughs) to be the first. But he became the first. And my mother-in-law just was like, she was in her own glory. Hands raised as the count had been reached there in California and said, oh, I just thank you, Jesus, that my dream." had become true. Anybody been there? And there were always those who are of one generation who probably have said, I would have never believed it, 
But I dreamt that it would happen. Dreams. Dreams do come true. Dreams. And if you don't have a dream, you don't have much of a life. There's no sense of hope that you're living from day to day. But, but dreams are the very things that keep you moving towards some sense of destiny because you believe that what you are dreaming about will become a reality. There is in this passage of scripture a sense in which generations have passed from the time of Joel's preaching in the second chapter, especially of the Old Testament in his book of Joel, to this moment here when Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. And what I believe is being said is that you should never let a generation not have a dream. And it's important for each generation to have a dream. Our dreams are not the same as the dreams of those who are young. Now, you probably would say to me, Pastor, I see dreams and I see visions. What's the difference? Well, dreams are that which you have when you're sleeping. Visions are that which you have when you're wide awake. Can I talk a little bit about it? The interesting thing, it says that old men have dreams and young men have visions. Let me see if I can understand that. I guess old men are sleeping more. <laughs> but the dreams of both, and the visions of both there. We just deal with a different set of times. Our dreams were that we would be freer. Our dreams would be that we could go to places and eat and not be restricted and place in corners. Our dreams were that we would not be turned down and no vacancy signs. Our dreams were that we would not have labeled fountains. Our dreams would not be that we'd have bathrooms that were labeled. Our dreams is that we could go to a school no matter where it's located. Our dreams. But don't these young people have dreams too? I think so. And I think their dreams are just as significant as ours. They dream of a better world. They dream of times when there won't be shootings on their streets and people dying unnecessarily. I believe their dreams are just as important and maybe, maybe even greater than our dreams and the enemies that they have to fight and deal with seem to be colossal. But if I could help a young person today, I would say, go on, dream your dreams. Have your visions. Because the same God that has made our dreams and our visions possible will do the same thing as well. And when I looked at this passage of Scripture and see the vast time difference from Joel to Peter, I would declare to you that God was still marching and God was still fighting on our behalf. What I've watched there in terms of this passage of Scripture is how Joel was dreaming. Even in the midst of the nation of Israel living in a time in which locusts were scavenging the whole plants of what they had raised as crops. And yet he would say that the locusts will die and the crops will come back again. He was dealing with the whole period of time when Israel was in bondage by uh, foreign nations. But he would be able to say that we will be free one day. Here it is much many years later, but yet Peter can make it the same declaration. And the thing about it is that it's not a matter of your changing. The matter is how God is going to make the change. I believe that John Maxwell was right when he said that teamwork makes the dream work. You can't do it on your own. You don't have the substance nor the resources to do it in your own way. But I believe that what was really being said as Peter was making this pronunciation on the day of Pentecost is that this is a reasonable day which, which we can celebrate. It's an opportunity to talk about the 50s and the third and the ideas of how the Lord would create the plants that would grow. And we remember Moses and the things that happened during Moses' time. But he would also say, don't forget that this particular celebration called the Feast of the Weeks is when no one works. No one is in labor. 
and that everyone, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you have or whether you have not, you will have a time off. Here's the marvels of God. God knows how to level the playing fields, my friends. God knows how to just straighten things out, that no matter who you are, God knows how to engineer your life so that no matter who might be over you or who might be under you, you are always going to be in a place of homostasis, of balance because of God. He's an interesting person, that God of ours, because even when somebody seems like they've got so much, he knows how to straighten things out that you're just as equal and better than that and maybe as good as everybody else. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Our God knows how to level playing fields. For the same sickness that befalls you is going to befall somebody else. The same troubles that get in your life is going to get in somebody else's life. The same ways that somehow you've got to deal with is going to be the same thing that somebody else is going to have to deal with. I'm just glad that he stops by every now and again to relieve us of the ability to think that we are less than, but more than anything else, that God is still in control. You can't do this thing by yourself. I hear you, Mr. Maxwell, but the thing about teamwork is that it will make the dream work, but we need the one who makes it all work. Hmm. Can I stay with this a little bit more? And so what he says, when the Holy Spirit falls upon you. In other words, you can do what you can do, but you need me. I'm the one who's the captain of the team. I'm the one who's the star on the team. I'm the one who's sending the messages in as the coach. I'm the one that's in charge. Well, let's help me out a little bit more. It's the Holy Spirit. And I know sometimes folks freeze at the second chapter. They get a little concerned. But isn't it amazing what God can do? And the whole matter of the Holy Spirit is he's what we call theologically the paraclete. The one who walks beside us. The one who's on our side. The one who's on our right when we're kind of falling in that direction or on our left when we're leaning in that direction. The one who knows how to brace us up and encourage us and keep us going. In other words, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, is the one who's on our team. No, I take that back. The, the one whose team we're on. And isn't it good news to know that you're on his team? Is there anybody here that might be uncertain about being on his team? And so if I can just scan this passage of Scripture, these 40 through the 47th verse, I would say that there's some things that will help you to understand that you're on God's team. Because it's good to be on the Lord's team. It's good to know that the Lord is in charge of the team. It's good to know that God knows how to make our dreams come true. It's good to know that he knows how to make your visions take place. It's good to know because he did it for Jacob. You remember Jacob there by that, that well? And yet he didn't know whether he should go back or go forward. But God told him, I will bless you and bless your offsprings. And I will make a way for you in the midst of the no ways of your life. It's good to know that the God that I serve would show up when Joseph was in a pit there in Egypt and tell him you're going to rise to be second in command. The Lord knows how to work it out in your life. Sometimes we don't know, but you got to understand that sometimes a dream can be like a nightmare. You can cause your body to lift up on your bed and you'll be wondering what in the world is going on. you got sweat even at midnight hours. you got troubles in your life, but I've got a news for you. When the Lord has you on his team, he's going to work it out. Or go on through that night, go on through that morning, go on through the day, just realizing that the Lord will work it out. And what did he bring about? What birth that took place was the birth of the church. What's your dream for your church? What's your vision for your church? Can I help you to realize that it shouldn't be any different just like Joel and Peter, and the same thing of the people of that first century to now, 
the century of 2016? Uh, what is it that's in the passage of Scripture? Well, I, I, I believe that it's a matter of coming together. Oh, what a blessing it is when people come together. You see, coming together is an achievement. Hmm. Staying together is progress. Working together is success. If you can bring people together, you've done something. If you can bring us together, only God can do that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But look at it, look at it, look at it. On the day of Pentecost, there were people from all over the world who spoke in all different languages, but yet they understood what God was saying. Coming together sometimes requires us to stop being concerned about my own language and my own ways, but to understand I've got to do it God's way. It's not easy coming together. But when you learn how to come together, it's amazing what you can accomplish. You can see your dreams come true. You can have your visions, and your visions will take place and become reality. When we learn how to come together, we'll understand that God can work miracles in our lives. Every place as you read in this 40th verse through the 47, you will find either the word one accord or all or together. When you start out that second chapter, you'll find the word, and they came together in one accord and in one place. The Greek word for accord happens to be an unusual and significant word that means same mind. All oh, what a blessing it is we can come together on the same mind, which means the same thought, which means that we're thinking alike. We may not always agree about what we're thinking about, but the beautiful thing about it is that everybody is thinking about doing the same thing. And when you look at it, the truth of the matter is everybody ought to be thinking about winning. Everybody ought to think about being prosperous. Everybody ought to think about being healthy. Everybody ought to think about being able to do better in life. We all ought to be thinking along the same line. The beautiful thing about it is that they all came together, even though they were of, of different communities, of different nations. I believe that the hope of the young people of the day is that they're going to see that kind of coming together like never, ever before. And my prayer would be for that same kind of coming together. Is it possible? Oh, teamwork makes the dream work. Dream big dreams. Dream, dream dreams where your mind is like the mind of Christ. For only the Lord can bring us together. Interestingly enough, secondly, you will not only find that they were coming together, but they were caring together. And you watch out, and so especially as you get around, around about that 46th verse, and talk about how they came together. But what you will see is how they cared for one another. It's a, it's a blessed passage of Scripture when you begin to read it, that no one ever had a need. They all came together and met the needs of one another. Everybody had something. There was no sense of selfishness. They sold their possessions. They gave of their goods. They divided what they had so that no one would be without need. And then it says that they even went house to house. 
Oh, come on with me just a moment. I know that every now and again I go back to my own neighborhood and my own community. But the, the lady next door, when she didn't have sugar, would knock on the door and say, Miss Georgette, do you have a little sugar? Or when somehow she didn't have any flour, Miss Georgette, do you have a little flour? Now let me make this very fair. Miss Georgette will go to her, her house and say, can I, can I get some coffee? And matter of fact, even sometimes when things were tough and rough, and sometimes you're almost down to your last dime, it was good to have a kind of relationship where you could go next door to your neighbor and be able to say, neighbor, I'm a little low in my funds, but is it possible that you can help me out a little bit until the first of the month or whenever it was, until I get paid, however that is, whatever the day is, can I just... Just ask a little bit to get me over. Just trying to struggle to help me make ends meet. You know what ends meet. I just need a little bit to make it through. But there is a day that ought to come, and it ought to come soon, where we all need to know that somehow, somewhere, somebody is going to need. And it's a beautiful thing when we know how to care for one another. If somebody could ask me what the church looks like, I would say it's a caring community. That when I'm sick, somebody's going to come and sit by my bedside. When I've got sorrow in my family, somebody's going to come and comfort me. When I've got troubles in my life, I've got somebody that I can turn to. Isn't that what it should be? And here it is that the passage of Scripture said that's how they started. Well, I believe that it's going to mean that that's how we're going to end. So if you're not there with that kind of mindset, you ought to get on board, get on the team, and realize that we're heading on home. But where is heading on home? For finally, not only do you find that they come together, but not only do they come together, they were caring together, but also it says that they were celebrating together. Look at that last verse, if you will. And it says, praising God and having favor with the people. I found that kind of ironic. The same folk that was praising at the end was the ones at the beginning saying they're drunk. They boozed up. High as kites. All because they're happy. Don't ever get too happy. But somebody might have a wrong notion about you. Don't ever get so joyed. Then you see the goodness of the Lord. Somebody might say you're insane. Don't ever get to the point where you're almost floating because somebody might say something's wrong with him. When you're doing good and doing well, you got a smile on your face even when things aren't going right. Somebody might say something is wrong with you. Can I just interpret that as a, as a way of looking at the scripture passage? Uh, it's not that you are drunk or anything. It's just that you're looking at the fact that the one whose team you're on is not going to let anything happen to you. You can smile when there's adversity. You can laugh when there's trouble in your life. You can even begin to jump a little bit. And somebody will ask the question, why in the world are you praising God? Well, who else can I praise but the good God that I love and I know loves me? Who else can I look to in the times of my struggles and the times of my trouble? Who else can I call on? And then what God does is cause those who don't like you to wind up liking you. Oh, my goodness. What a mighty God we serve. There's none like him. And guess what? Keep on working at it. Oh, every now and again when a song comes, pat your feet every now and again. When somehow music moves in your life, clap your hands every now and again. Say, I praise the Lord because we're on our way. And one of these days, we're going to be together when we all get together. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we're going to sing, we're going to shout, hey, hey, hey. We're going to 
Bible say and shout the victory. Is there anybody here for the rehearsal? Has anybody stopped by this morning in the midst of the rain for the practice? Is anybody here saying, I just thought I'd pop in because I heard that there's a team around here. And I want to get on the team. I don't have to carry the ball. I don't have to have a time to be a pinch hitter. Just let me be in the bleachers. Let me wear my, my jersey. I just want to be on the team. And I just want to be in the number. I just want to be a part of those who love the Lord. Those who know of his appearing. Ah. One day, one day, we shall see him and behold him. Won't you stand to your feet? The formula has already been given to us. What he wants of us is clear. Read, it, read the scripture passage. God's been saying it for years. Love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, with all your might. Listen to it. Picks it up in Leviticus, 18th chapter, and he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Simple stuff. Can our communities be better? Yes, they can. Can our relationships be better? Yes, they can. But you know that the one who owns the team, the one who's in charge, doesn't want us to live the way we have been living. When I played baseball as a little boy, my coach dared us to get angry. Because if you got angry on his team, he, was, he would bench you. His, say, his saying was that if you lose your, your temper, you can lose the game. Because you're going to fall apart. But when your mind is in Christ, It's amazing what you can do. He knows how to govern your whole life. Bring over you that absolute calm and peace. And cause you to be able to manage the issues of your life like you've never had before. Because you know whom you can depend on. You know who's holding you up. You know who's keeping you. You know who's providing for you. We want to take this moment out and extend an invitation. This is sign-up day. I was so happy to hear about two young men in this area signing up with some lucrative contracts or even possibilities. And, that, and they have now the opportunity of a great and brighter future. But playing days are not going to be forever. Getting on the team is a, is a difficulty. Because as good as you might be, there's always somebody else that possibly could be better. But this team, Isn't it good news that takes the worst of the lot? You can fumble the ball and still be on this team. You don't have to have sticky hands that can pick up anything. 
catch fly balls like Willie Mays? Have you dropped any balls lately? Has anything ever went under your legs and through? Has anybody made any errors? Oh, I'm all by myself. Let me raise both hands. But isn't it good to know that the team that we can be on, the team of Jesus the Christ, that you can be at your worst and still make the team. Thank God for grace and for mercy. Maybe somebody here that needs to know the Lord wants you, wants to sign you up today.